One thing that this enables, and, and I think this is probably something that uh, is kind of popular, is <clears throat> in a traditional system environment, or I, I guess it's in interesting that vo uh, virtualization has become traditional in the sense that it was once kind of the, the late breaking, but it is kind of traditional technology now. Um, most IT departments are running in virtualization. Most of us are running on our laptops to do um, daily development work, those kinds of things. <clears throat> you can migrate an application. Let's pretend that it's written in language X. I don't want to pick one because I uh, don't want to get into uh, discussions of religion uh, while, I'm, while I'm presenting. Language X and Language X version 1 may or may not be compatible with version 2. Well, let's say, for example, Fedora 22 is, is still sitting on, langu on Language X version 1. Um, but we want to take advantage of some new feature or some new performance component uh, that has come out in Fedora 23. Well, we can take a platform, uh, a platform container base image based on 22, put our application inside of that container, and then run that container on uh, Fedora 23. And this uh, enables us the ability to kind of take application runtimes away from being bound to the host uh, in, in a way that allows us to actually not have to duplicate the operating system. So we don't need to duplicate the kernel and the entire file system tree and glibc and, and lang packs and all of these different things. We don't need to duplicate that. We, need to, we don't need to, to share that across storage. Now, I do want to say that containers don't necessarily replace virtualization in, in many cases because of the nature of, of different aspects of it, but you do have this new ability to do that. You kind of are, are afforded this, this uh, luxury. So moving on, uh, something that has kind of sprung up or I'm not sure which is the chicken and the egg in this one uh, because <clears throat> microservices have become more popular as a side effect of containers, but containers uh, also are becoming the de facto standard mechanism by which we deliver microservices. So microservices, microservices again, this is another topic that's not entirely new. Um, I like to reference it um, back to the microkernel uh, idea. And, and microkernels have existed for a very, very long time. These can absolutely buy beer in, uh, in most countries. And the idea is that you have different small components of the system that interact with one another through some kind of interprocess communication. Um, and you could potentially have the interprocess communication be across the network. And if we were to default to a network, we could then geographically disperse components of the system and we could uh, replicate components of them and load balance different components and, and allow them to go up and down. Uh, and, and that's, microkernels kind of do that. And for anybody who's vaguely familiar with microkernels, uh, likely knows about the Amoeba operating system. And that's kind of what they did, was they were, had the ability to have multiple network, com network connected computers have different components of the low level system running anywhere on the network. And it presented itself as a single computer. If we take that idea kind of up the stack, further up um, the, the application stack and our kind of hierarchical um, I guess, data model for, for what layers of the stack there are for applications, we, we have very similar parallels in the sense that <clears throat> we can now have tiny components of what were previously monolithic systems and kind of move them around. Uh, and, and you could effectively argue that system administrators have been doing this for a very long time using pipes. I mean, you, you effectively have these tiny applications that do one thing and do them well, and you submit inputs through one side of a interprocess communication mechanisms and comes out the other side, and then you can kind of daisy chain those together to create a solution. Now, your insane, you know, like 30 utility one-liner is maybe not the best way to run an enterprise, but uh, it's, it's a decent example of what we can do with, with some kind of you know, pass-through of, of small utilities. So um, services the Unix way, the Unix way being a giant quotation, huge air quotes around that because it, you're going to get a different definition of, who you talk, of what that is depending on who you talk to. However, um, I like to believe it as you do one thing and you do it well. That's kind of the, the distilled version of it, broken down. So you can kind of de decouple previously tightly integrated components such that they are uh, more loosely coupled, they can be more interchanged, 
as long as you comply with this standard, some, some kind of an API standard that you come up with, uh, you can plug in, plug in, replace different components of this. And if you have them loosely coupled, uh, you can kind of take that idea from, from the Amoeba micro uh, kernel operating system and, and geographically disperse different components of the system if you want to. <clears throat> and in such a way that they can interact just like as though they were local. And, and if you do this over the network, well, you can do it local host and you can do your loopback network. And if you wanted to host it all in one, one environment, or you can geographically disperse it. And we get into a world where we have um, infrastructure as a service clouds. You have cloud providers that allow you to geographically disperse this literally across the globe in multi-zone, multi-tenant, all of these different environments. And, and that will hopefully add redundance and resiliency to, to the application, uh, to the service. And what we can do with that is have smaller components that are more focused and more worked on, more easily testable independently in a way that we can iterate on them faster and we can keep code quality up and, and just hopefully get to a point where development is faster, but we're not sacrificing on uh, quality. So immutable infrastructure. <clears throat> this is actually a new one. This is something that has, has kind of popped up a little, bit, a little bit more recently, and it's kind of gaining ground. And some of the newer technologies that have come up, containers being one of them, the more proliferation of, of people wanting to use microservice architectures have kind of led to this. Immutable infrastructure is effectively fully automated. It should be able to be deployed, redeployed, torn down um, with minimal human interaction. And <clears throat> the idea behind that is, is not so much that, okay, you can fire up some virtualization templates and have some kind of a, a post boot task run and reboot them into new updates and then run your configuration management. The goal is, is at deploy time, you're done. And, and that's kind of what we, what we get to. It, it should be static. Once deployed, you don't change it. If you need to make a change, you redeploy. It's this new paradigm of, of don't config management in the environment. Config management at build time and don't change the environment. Keep the environment static in nature to the best of your ability. Um, and this allows you to have these immutable pieces. And these pieces can be tested as a, as a cohesive unit. And we can then deploy them and verify that the thing that made it through testing is the thing that's running in production. No, nothing out there changed. No, no mutable state, um, or should in an ideal world, nothing has changed. And that gives us the ability to verify that an unexpected change because of some software update or because of some config management agent running out from under us because you know, new person X or new person Y s committed to master on accident on for the, you know, the git check-in for, for the config management. Um, <clears throat> so what we effectively deploy is a build artifact. We no longer deploy in traditional senses of the word and have these, or have these automated configuration management jobs run, you deploy a build artifact. And your build artifact could be a container image. So if you were to take your Docker image and had your Docker file and it ran and it did, it did its thing, and at the end you have this image, you can then distribute that image and start the service. There should be no required added configuration management. And you can then put your configuration management in the build time. So you don't need to run it on the end host because you should be able to run it inside of the confines within the context of the container build, uh, the container image build, uh, such that all of your configuration that you want does it up on the host just like it always has, except your delivery mechanism is different. You are instead effectively shipping a tarball that has everything in it as you wanted it, and that tarball with its metadata can run within the Docker uh, environment. So need a configuration change, build new artifact. Um, and then artifacts can then be tested and graduate. So you can have your, your dev test stage production pipeline, and that build artifact should be able to graduate in between each environment and potentially load different configuration components so that you're not pointing at your production database 
But you have this idea where this image can, can go through unchanged because let's just say, for example, um, some new update of library Z. Uh, library Z shows up and you have version 1.1 in dev, test, and stage. Well, 1.2 landed and it had a security fix. So the ops team did an update to production. Let's say something changed and your application didn't take that into account. So you, then you move and, and within the window by which your software graduated from stage to production, something changed out from under it, things crash. Your rollback procedure, what's your rollback procedure look like? Well, in some scenarios that can be painful. With container type technologies, it's very simple because you can change the tag that points to and restart the service. So these build artifacts afford us some, some interesting capabilities. So this is good for um, red, black, blue, green, uh, et cetera, deployment models. And I'm going to kind of walk through one uh, deployment model that, uh, that exam is an example of this. So, and I stole these images from uh, Mr. Mike McGrath. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's say that you're running version one of your software and you want to do an update. Take a node out and you upgrade, uh, or you, you have your, your tests and CI run through, everything passes, and you update on version 1.2. You put it back in rotation, everything looks good, so okay, fine, let's go ahead and roll it out to the rest of the environment. Seems pretty straightforward, should work, everything's good. Now, uh, what happens when something breaks on one of the nodes? <clears throat> let's assume that you can just think of the wildest doomsday scenario you can come up with. Somebody just walked into the data center and kicked the power cord out from under you. Um, something crashed. Somebody put a really bad custom RPM trigger in one of the packages that your infrastructure team runs for whatever version. Again, new person XYZ shows up and commits to master on accident, and that gets packaged and rolled out as part of your deployment automation. Something. How clean is your rollback procedure? <clears throat> How do you verify your components? How do you know what state your file system is in? How do you know what state your kernel is in? Let's say that the power cable got kicked out in the middle of the kernel update. Let's say for some reason it's generating the init ram FS. Your changes are in grub, but you haven't finished the, the init build, the dracket run, and you don't reboot. How do, you, how do you log into your system if it's somewhere in the cloud? Well, you can. There's the web console, and that's clunky and terrible, and we go through and we do what we must. But <clears throat> what, if, um, what if we could avoid that? Uh, also, do you know how far a package made it? By show of hands, everybody familiar with RPM package triggers? About a third. That's good. OK, here they are. This is from the documentation that comes with RPM. This is in user bin doc or I'm sorry, user share doc uh, RPM. And this is, this is literally what it says. And all package managers have this. Like, RPM's not special, and like, it magically has these weird flaws. Every, every package manager has to have an order of operations, the steps by which it goes through. And this is kind of what you have. And um, at every step of the way, some script or some trigger can take effect and cause a side effect. <clears throat> so if, if we're doing this in an upgrade timeline, for your application in your production environment. This is mutable state. This is something that could potentially go wrong in the event of a failure. Whereas if all we're doing is an all or nothing, a, a update to a new deployment image, um, the worst case scenario is you roll back to the previous deployment image by changing a tag and restarting your service. So what if we take that concept a step further and we had immutable operating systems? So that's where Project Atomic comes in. So Project Atomic um, is an upstream project uh, based around taking concepts of immutability and the available, or the, the, the idea that you can have these deployment artifacts effectively. You have a build artifact that can be tested as a cohesive unit, that can be applied and rolled out as a cohesive unit that is all or nothing. You're either upgraded to it or you're not. <clears throat> and and it, it, it includes some newer technologies, and it's also built on top of, of more traditional technologies in the sense that we're not reinventing the world overnight, but we're doing iterative improvements on the world that we had before. 
So we have a lot of our tried and trusted. <clears throat> and, and I mentioned that it's an upstream project, and we have both Fedora and CentOS, because both Fedora and CentOS are working with the upstream project Atomic um, team to uh, create atomic technology-based distributions. Um, being part of the Fedora team, I'm going to talk specifically about the Fedora um, project Atomic, but um, our friends in CentOS land are, are working with us, uh, working with the upstream uh, as well. So <clears throat> it, it, in, it inherits everything from the parent distro. So everything that you previously had in terms of your RPM sets, what you expect to be on the system, those kinds of things, you're going to find a lot of them there. Everything, all of the 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 your standard tools, those kinds of things, you're going to find them there. What's changing is the delivery mechanism, the delivery mechanism by which that we update our system. And that's going to take a little, you know, there's going to be a little bit of education in terms of getting people um, up to date with the newer technologies, and as there always is. Uh, however, there's also kind of an added aspect to this to where in an immutable environment, you don't want changes. So you, you don't want to necessarily do package installs onto a live system. You would instead build a new deployment artifact. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's a minimized footprint. Uh, what a Fedora Atomic Host is at face value is we, we are aiming to do a minimized footprint. We're trying to um, have it tuned and be out of the box, the best at running container type workloads. Um, hopefully we succeed at that. If not, uh, show up to the Fedora Cloud SIG, let us know, participate. Uh, we're always looking to do better. So atomic updating and rollback means that it's easy to deploy, update, and rollback using OS trees. And what OS trees are, um, I'll actually talk about in a minute, but that's our new deployment artifact uh, in terms of how we actually dis, uh, do that. And then uh, orchestration, and that's where um, the Kubernetes piece comes in, and we'll talk about that briefly. So, mm -hmm. checking out I'm doing on time here. All right. <clears throat> uh, the orchestration piece allows us to, oh, 10 minutes? Okay. All right, I'll go a little bit quicker. I thought I had, thought I had more time. I do not. Okay, so Atomic Host. Deployments are upgrades of RPM OS trees. And an OS tree is, is this, um, it's an entire root file system tree managed very similar to git commits in, sen in the sense that you have a reference that you can um, revert back to or roll forward to, and it gives you this, this ref ID that you can, can now move around. RPM OS tree is a utility and a technology that allows us to build OS trees out of sets of RPMs. So you can use these package pieces of software that you've always had, but then put them into an RPM OS tree, and then you p use RPM OS tree to be your distribution mechanism of that build artifact. Um, upgrades are atomic in nature, which is a lot of where Project Atomic got its name. It's all or nothing. So if you're in the middle of an upgrade, there is no, you kicked, it, you kicked the power cord out, we don't know where it was on the RPM trigger, um, we don't know where it was in the kernel update, we don't know if that Dracket uh, run finished building our init RAM FS, because all of that gets sorted out at build time, and when we're doing the actual deployment, it's just deploying the build artifact. So, um, and uh, the entire tree is, and I mentioned this before, the entire tree is a cohesive unit. It, it gives you the ability to, to test this as, as a single thing. So the atomic command is currently a wrapper around RPM OS tree and Docker. Our atomic host is host-based commands. Atomic other commands do interaction with the Docker uh, daemon. Host upgrade, you can see we are doing an update from. It has a whole bunch more output, but I didn't want to cl clutter my slide too much. Atomic uh, host status, this, these are the references I was talking about. You have these IDs, and it talks about the, you have a version number, and you can, you can also actually go in and inspect what RPMs are in there. When it doesn't update, it actually tells you which RPMs change, what versions they've been updated to, those kinds of things. Orchestration. <clears throat> so we have, this, we have this immutable infrastructure deployed in place, and we have these uh, atomic, Fedora Atomic uh, deployed operating system images, and we're running containers. How do we run a bunch of containers across a bunch of hosts? Kubernetes. Glad you asked, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so it's distributed organization for containers, uh, and there's a bunch of different vocabulary terms that come in, into the play here, but kind of the few main ones are uh, pod, service, uh, replication controller. Um, yes, I think those are it. So pod is a set of containers, and they are um, scheduled as a single unit, so they will go to a node. Uh, they share a number of aspects of the systems, process ID space, 
um, IPC, network, UTS, um, and this allows them to speak to each other as though they were on local host, because they will be. Um, a service is a set of one or more pods that can, each pod can be distributed to different nodes, and the service brings them together as a, as a cohesive unit across the environment. Um, from there, we have a replication controller that manages those pods, and then node-level proxy for load balancing uh, to the services, and then pl pluggable aspect or pluggable options for overlay and persistent storage providers. Developers, I did not forget about developers. All of everything I've been talking about in a lot of ways are, is catered towards, or at least my, my hope was that the, the tone of it was catered towards oper, ops teams. However, the development teams, you can take these concepts and the, these ideas and apply them to your development lifecycle. That's where OpenShift Origin comes in. OpenShift Origin builds on top of these concepts and on top of these technologies and provides a, a standard containers API. It, it provides kind of a, um, a self-service out of the box um, dev panel such that developers can pick and choose the components they want. They will be deployed using these container technologies and the developers are presented with a development environment that they can then just commit code into. The code will go through a build pipeline that's completely configurable, completely scriptable, has Jenkins plugin APIs um, and those kinds of things. And you can then take that and you can either run it using OpenShift because OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes uh, in production, or you can take that container, you can take that definition of an application out of that environment and then run it into a, in a directly Kubernetes environment, uh, Kubernetes-based environment running on top of uh, Project Atomic for a, uh, a fully uh, atomic, or a fully immutable inf infrastructure-based pipeline from dev to production. I ran out of time, sorry, I meant to cover a few things more. Uh, do I have questions? Yes. You said you implied something that I wasn't 100% clear. You said that a pod in Kubernetes is always restricted to an environment where the containers are coherent and be in the same space that can communicate on the same execution context. Is it a single one? OK, the question basically boiled down to is a pod in Kubernetes always on a single host? Yes. 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 Okay. And if that changed, uh, I, I will admit that there is a asterisk on that. To the best of my knowledge, it was. Uh, if that if that changed, I apologize. But yeah, it, it, it's it's it, it was as defined um, as of not that long ago as as a single host that had intercommunication between between the pod or between the containers inside the pod. Yes. Okay, so uh, the question is basically, do, do I have much uh, perspective on how many people are actually using configuration management and build? Um, I, I don't necessarily know that I would, I would highly recommend it as the path. Um, I generally kind of offer that up as like kind of a stepping stone. Like as you move into this, everything that you used to do in config management can now be put into the build time. And as you adopt the newer tech, absolutely, you should be using Kubernetes secrets and those kinds of things to inject and, and uh, supply uh, config data to to your containers, but um, that's probably something I could or should be more clear on. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, I I, I know of of about half a dozen people who do uh, in, inject their config management at build time, just because they have so much investment in all their config management to be able to containerize applications that just made sense. Uh, I want to add to that. The other thing to use the config management for is to actually build all those Kubernetes files. Okay, uh, the comment was uh, use config management to build your Kubernetes files to begin with. Yeah. Which, yeah, absolutely. Um, you, could, you could totally do that. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense, especially if you, again, have a lot of investment in a, uh, a config management product. Um, I mean, uh, so one of, the, one of the teams I'd previously worked on had many years of investment in, uh, in a configuration management infrastructure and had many, many services built out that way. Um, so the first stepping stone into the, the container runtime world where we started running things in production in Docker was to just inject the config management runtime at, at the build. 
Any other questions? One in the back, yes. Yes. Okay, so the comment was effectively that the consensus at config management camp was not that config management is dead or dying, um, but that it needs to evolve uh, into the newer technology and the newer workflows similar to this. Did I, did I do okay on that? All right, cool. Any other questions? All right, thank you all for your time. Yay! I'm not sure, like, oh, yeah. yeah, whether they can just grab it or. Oh, here. <laughs> Hello? Hey, if you asked a question, please come see me. I have swag for you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And could you please just copy your slides with uh, USB stick? Absolutely. That's all built into your. Um, so have you copied this yes, slide? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's all built into. Thank you. Uh, that's all built into. Uh, it tells how to do the traffic and how to do the. the um, oh, hola, well, Luis. It's good time. What's that? It's also curando. Estaba esta mañana en la oficina. Yo, ¿dónde está Julita? ¿Dónde está Julita? Y luego me acordé. Ah, sí, va a estar de de voluntaria. ¿Qué tal todo? Bueno, todo está aquí, Román. Sí, he visto a Román antes. Sí, todo tal? bien. Es llevas? mi primera conferencia de FUN. Ah, no bien. entiendo mucho, pero intento, ah, por lo menos. Bien. Es también como introducción. Sí, sí. Bueno, voy a hacer una vista al baño rápidamente y ahora vuelvo. Vale, nos vemos. Hi, Dan. Hi. I'm Julia. Julia, nice to meet you. ¿Cuál es still? ¿O tenemos solo una clase? Let me check. Uh, para menita boda. I think it's all still. All still? Yeah. Then it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're the winner. <laughs> I think all the weather we have is actually still. It's still excellent. Yeah. Rastra. <laughs> Just a few announcements. Please ask questions at the end of the presentation. You can get some cool swag. And also, pretty please gently close the doors when you leave the room or when you come back, because it can get very disturbing for the speaker. And in the meantime, please feel free to tweet and blog about DEF CONF. There is also a competition for the best blog post. So you can also win some prizes for that. Yes, 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 yes.
because it's not deformed, just put it to Because you have full HD resolution, it down downscales it to 800 by 600. Yeah, so we can. It's alright with me. Yeah, if it's okay with you, then yeah. Otherwise, you can just put go to settings and change the resolution in a second. Uh, Mike.